Hey, it's Dr. Dave Nickel here. Really quick video blog for me today. I want to talk about this. This headline in the Vet Times, BVA, 80% of vets intimidated by client behavior. And I'm seeing a lot of chat about this at the minute. This is the thing that's blowing up in the UK. Probably resonates with you wherever you are in the world. And, and a lot of people are getting down and, and sort of getting stuck into the fact that as vets and nurses and receptionists, as people working in the veterinary profession, we end up getting quite um, badly treated by clients um, from time to time. And so this is kicking off a little bit. And it's interesting to me, not because the headline actually, the headline, I'm a bit surprised that it's not 100%, okay? Um, 80% seems kind of low. Um, but that bit's not the interesting bit to me. The bit, the interesting bit for me is the reaction of everybody to this headline or to this finding. And to be honest with you, this finding is not news to me at all. And it's probably not news to you either. Like, go figure, occasionally we see clients and they get grumpy at us. The bit that's interesting to me is the reaction. And, and so what I'm seeing out there are people saying how it's disgraceful that clients, you know, we shouldn't have to put up with this and it's disgraceful and it's horrible and, you know, oh, woe is us and, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And, and I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, this is the same problem, the same group of uh, excuses or the same behavior that leads us to blame the universities because there's no vets around or to blame the fact that everyone's a woman in veterinary, veterinary medicine. So that's why we can't hire anyone because they're, they're going to have babies or that millennials don't want to work hard and get sick when you ask them to do on call so they leave the profession. It's the same, it's the same underlying problem in the response to the, the headline that vets are intimidated by client behavior. Um, the same response is that we're blaming the clients in the same way we're blaming all those other groups for the reason we can't hire vets. It's back to the blame game. I swear to God, the blame game is the biggest threat to us in veterinary practice, like bar none, bar none. Forget technology, forget the shortage of vets, forget angry clients. It's the blame game. And here's here's why I think that's a problem. The, the response to this, like, as I say, 100% of clients, like 100% of vets, I would be unsurprised to hear that I've had some form of intimidating behavior from clients. Now, of course, there are the crazy clients out there that no one is going to be able to handle. And there are the really sad occasions where, you know, an animal is lost. Uh, and, and so there's just, there's really no way back from that moment when you lose an animal under an anesthetic or something like that, and it's unexpected you're going to have a mad client and that is going to express itself in anger and our reaction to anger is almost always going to be to feel intimidated by that. Um, that said, the, uh, the majority of us deal with client situations that we have to look at our hand in creating that situation. And what I mean by that is what, where were we in the conversation or the interaction? How did we create the situation or what were we contributing to the situation that caused the client to become intimidating? Okay, now what you can't control, what I can't control, nobody can control someone else's emotional intelligence and how they respond to adversity and stress. And so when we're dealing with uh, four-legged furry family members and we're also asking people to pay uh, reasonably large sums of money for their treatment, then of course we have the foundation for a higher stress moment. You know, if something goes wrong with my car uh, and the garage always wants like a thousand pounds, I find that stressful. Everyone would because, you know, it's a drain on the family finances. Um, and so it's, you don't control how other people's respond to stress, but you can entirely control, number one, their expectations of what's coming down the pipeline here and make sure that they're aware that they are not um, corralled and, and that if they don't have the money, there is always a plan B. Um, but you can also, I think, control how you communicate them with them throughout the process when there's changes happening to treatment plans and expectations are not gonna be met. You can be in there much earlier than a lot of people go. And you can control your emotional response to people 
um, when they're in situations that are likely to cause them stress. And of course, anger is an emotional response to uh, an external stimuli of some kind, okay? We don't just get angry for no reason. We get angry because we feel something is unfair or something is unjust. Um, uh, and, and often that is part of a fear-based response, fear of losing money, fear of having less money, fear of losing a pet, fear of all sorts of different things. So I think that a lot of us, a lot of us experience clients that are unhappy or are angry or become intimidating because of the things that we do in our job and the things that we are 100% in control of, which is why this sort of headline and the fury that then comes out of it drives me a bit nuts. The headline doesn't drive me nuts, the response drives me nuts. Because then we just blame all clients and all clients are crazy. And you know what, if you go about your job in veterinary medicine and you think clients are all mean, bad people, you're gonna have a miserable time in veterinary medicine. And actually, if that is the belief, is that the story you tell yourself about clients, guess what's gonna happen? They're gonna all be angry and miserable with you. Let's break that down why that happens, okay? So something happens in your life as a vet where a client gets angry, okay? And let's just say it's because you didn't quote them the right amount or you didn't estimate them. And so when you come to give them the bill, the bill is like 200 pounds or dollars more than they're expecting, then, and they're not, they don't know that's coming, then they're, they're going to feel unfairly treated and their emotional response to that is going to be to get angry. Is that their fault? No, completely not. You should have done the estimate. Okay, you should have, you, if it's going to change from the estimate, you should have called them and given them a chance to say yes or no to that. You should have involved them in the conversation. So there's an ownership thing there that you could have owned way more of that. But here's what happens next. Most of the time, because somebody's angry with us, we get defensive or we get kind of anxious or frustrated or maybe angry back. We're not managing our emotional status, so we're pouring petrol in the fire. We're trying to justify things to them. Um, when somebody on the other side of the table is not ready to have any justification, so they get angrier um, because they feel like they're not being listened to. And so then it spirals out of control. So then you have a bad day and you go home, you go and you tell yourself, man, clients are annoying and angry. And so you know, maybe it's just that client, but then pretty soon because you're not communicating at the best of your game, because you're blaming the client for being angry, you then make the same mistake. You've not changed your behavior at all. And so you have another angry client or you have frequent, a frequency of angry clients that is above what is normal. And so pretty soon the story becomes, oh, all clients are assholes, right? And, and when that is your story, that is, that is the internal story you're telling yourself, your external behavior starts to change that you're starting to expect clients to be assholes. And if that's the case, then your, your behavior toward them is not empathetic. It's always going to be either abrupt or short, or it's just going to be clear you don't want to be in the room with them. So the charisma is going to be low, the trust is going to be low, the rapport is going to be low. And of course, in that situation, then you're far more likely to have complaints. You're far more likely to have pushback um, against your recommendations because trust is absolutely everything in this profession. Um, indeed, in almost any relationship. Um, so uh, it is super important that, that we don't get in the situation of telling ourselves the story that it's all the client's fault. Um, the flip side of that is, and the antidote to this kind of thing is really pretty simple and also remarkably transformative. So the first thing is being aware of when you're in a situation when a client might be upset, which is pretty much every situation where you're going to do something potentially dangerous to their animal, like put it under an anesthetic, or you're going to ask them for a, an amount of money that's more like more than 20 pounds, then there's a risk that a client's you know going to be unhappy if they don't get good service or not aware of why you're asking to do things or why you're actually doing things. So communication and managing expectations, um, including your own from the outset, is super important. So awareness that you're in a situation that's going to be potentially a volatile situation. Um, the second thing is management of expectations. So being clear what you're going to do, like what the plan is, what, what is the diagnosis? Um, you know, and, and so in those three steps, 
clients have to have that in their mind. If they're clear what your working diagnosis or your your at least the top three things that you're likely to be trying to rule out or rule in here are, then at least they've got a name to work with. Something they can go home and tell their spouse. Okay, the vet thinks it's hyperthyroidism or it's a it's it's dental disease or thinks there might be a, a ruptured ligament. You know, something they can go home and tell their spouse that this is the reason they're doing the x-rays and this is the reason it's going to cost a thousand pounds. Um, so they have to have that clarity. They have to have clarity that and trust that, that the plan is good and that you're the right person to be working on that animal. And then they have to know what the price is, roughly, in the form of a, an estimate, preferably printed. Because again, they've got to go home and have this whole conversation a second time around with somebody uh, who may or may not be paying the bill, who may or may not be as emotionally involved with the animal as they are. And so that's a big deal. So we have to be really good at communicating and our, our plan, our expectations, and managing their expectations at the outset. Um, the next thing is then managing our emotional response. So let's say something goes wrong in a case. Like it's easy when everything goes right, you get to the end. If they have, if they have trust in you, they know what the differential list was, the diagnosis happens to fall within that list, the bill falls in that list, the animal gets treatment, the animal gets better, happy days. Everything's good. You're not going to get an angry client in that situation. Where it falls down and where the problems are is if you're not correct in your initial differential list, which happens all the time in veterinary medicine because it's hard, um, or the, the then the plan needs to change because of that halfway through a, an approach or a treatment. Say you take an x-ray and suddenly that cough you were working up and you thought was a cardiac problem, you find secondary metastases in the chest. And now you're looking at a cancer workup, okay? completely different direction, completely different emotional state, and potentially a completely different bill. So there's there's three separate things that you're going to have to manage there um, in order to keep the client not necessarily happy because they're going to be upset, they're going to be sad, but they're not necessarily going to be angry. Um, surprised, yes. Maybe angry at life in general, but angry at you? I don't think so unless you get to the end of that workup, you don't communicate it, and then in the exam room you're showing them the x-rays, and then you say, it's cancer, and by the way, it's going to be £2,000, not £1,000. You, in, under those circumstances, can very much expect to be the brunt of somebody's anger. Um, so it's about then, okay, if something's changing, then how do we communicate that change? What conversation do we have to have with a pet owner in that moment that keeps them on side and keeps them from being... Um, abusive or feeling upset or feeling unfairly treated okay um because they won't feel abusive they'll feel unfairly treated and then they might be abusive or they may feel like um they're being ripped off and then they are going to become angry about that and could become abusive so you have to keep them from those feelings and the way you keep them from the feelings of um, being unfairly treated or being ripped off is to communicate with honesty with openness and with empathy and understanding their situation so that leads me to the next really important skill is empathizing. Like, what are they feeling? What are they experiencing? Like, for a lot of vets, this is something that is a diagnostic process. It's kind of clinical. And, and often, because we're quite smart, we don't often, or we don't always, rather, have a brilliant handle on the emotional side of the job that we're doing and the impacts that that, that can potentially have. And, and, and just doing the medicine isn't enough. We have to be thinking about What's the emotional journey the client's on there as well? So empathizing, walking in their shoes as we go through this, thinking about how is that client going to feel when I call them halfway through the dental and, and say, actually, it's not a scale on a poly, so there's 19 teeth to be extracted. Like that is a huge leap from a situation of it being a low cost bill and not a lot of work to their fears that their animal's never going to eat again properly because you're taking out his teeth or that you're ripping them off because why didn't you see that when you looked in their mouth? Um, there's a lot of a lot of um, pitfalls that you have to ne negotiate and navigate there. Um, now, so if, if you can manage expectations, if you can uh, clearly articulate what it is you want to do, why you want to do it, and what the plan is, uh, and what the cost is, and then you can stick to that plan, great. But what if it goes off the radar? What if it goes completely off piste and now you're in a situation or you have a complaint, something doesn't work out right um, from a client and now they are kind of justifiably or not, they're kind of mad. 
How do you handle that? How do you work with that? Well, look, there's a super simple process that if you walk through it, eight times out of 10, you're going to have a client that's not just happy, they're going to think you're great. Okay, and it's a simple process. There's like five steps to it. Here, here they are. First time client walks through, they're mad as hell. Job number one is identify the emotion that you think they're experiencing. And the way you do that is by listening to them. Okay, so if a client walks into my exam room or my practice and they're angry, the first thing I'm going to say is, oh no, I'm really sorry to, to hear that. Tell me more. I want to listen. And you let them vent. Okay, and that can be uncomfortable as hell because it's like brutal, honest, raw feedback you're getting. Okay, and it's the, the, your instinct will be to respond and to justify and to fight with them about the little points you think are unfair. Don't follow that instinct. Just listen. And as you're listening, write down the key important points or make mental notes of those things. And also try to name the emotion they're experiencing. Is it anger? Is it frustration? Is it anxiety? And um, what is it they're experiencing? Um, and then the next step is to, to name that. Okay, so then you acknowledge what they're saying after they're finished. You seek clarification, any points are not clear. Um, and after they're done, you say, okay, well, look, that's really upsetting if they're upset. I, you know, you name the emotions that that's really upsetting. Um, and I, I can see, see why you're angry. And then I actually empathize that and I say, you know what, I'd be kind of mad too if that was my situation. Or I'd be frustrated as hell. So now I'm, I'm, I've listened and now I'm empathizing. I'm, I'm sort of connecting with them and I'm showing them I'm on their side. Now, step number three is you just apologize. Now, you're not accepting responsibility. You're not saying everything they've said is absolutely true. All you're saying is sorry. That's it. Okay? An apology goes such a long way. Okay, so let's say somebody's come in and the bill was meant to be £700 and it was £1,000 and nobody really explained it. And they vented at you, they're mad as hell, and you go, oh, Mrs. Smith, I'm, I'm really sorry. Look, I, I, I can see why you're angry. I'd be angry if, I would, if I'd been charged 1000 and I expected 700 too. I'm really sorry this happened. Now, in saying I'm really sorry this happened, you're not saying we goofed everything up, we're bad human beings, we ought to burn in hell and be struck off. What you're saying is sorry. That doesn't make you more likely to get sued or make you um, more open to litigation. Actually, quite the opposite. There's plenty of data says an apology vastly reduces uh, your chances of that happening. And actually, this process massively reduces that too. So the third, that's number three, apologize. And then number four step is ask what you can do to make it better. What would you like? Mr. Smith, that's really bad. And um, what can I do to make this better for you? and they may ask for some money off, okay? Uh, or they may just ask for the same thing never to happen to anybody else. Um, or they may ask for you to redo it, repeat it. If it didn't work, there's a whole bunch of things they might ask for there. Now, if it is within your power, it does not sink your business and you value this customer staying with you in the future and you feel like their complaint is warranted, my strongest advice to you is that you do what it is they asked. Because if you listen, you apologize and you put it right, you will have a delighted client who walks away from that situation going, what just happened? That never happens. Businesses don't listen to their customers. Businesses don't apologize. Businesses don't put it right that easily. It's always a, it's always a pain in the backside. It's always hard to get businesses to do anything. And they will love you. Um, and I guarantee you, that's what would happen. Okay. If it is not within your power to do these things, or if it is not you feel like the client is really out of line and they're they're just not a good client and they're creating problems then you know you have a decision to make in that point that moment and so now we can actually go down the route of saying okay well, look I can't do that but here's what I can do for you or if we think they're a terrible client you can say look Mrs. Jones um, I understand all these things I'm sorry that's been your experience um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to speak to all the members of staff and I'm going to get back to you with a response. You don't have to answer everything there and then. In fact, it's totally uh, like better for you if you don't answer queries in a strong emotional situation when you are being emotionally triggered as well because you're probably not going to have your best thoughts. Um, you're probably not going to have the best responses. Your amygdala, your naughty amygdala, is going nuts and lighting up your whole sort of limbic system uh, and so your fight or flight mode is on, your rational thinking brain is off. And so 
it is highly unlikely you're going to come back with some like Oscar Wilde-esque brilliant moment of clarity in that, that second. Probably all you're going to do is make things worse. So that's for me is, okay, I've got your side of things. I need to speak to my team, find out what's going on there. And I'm going to get back to you in like X hours or X days or however long it takes. So set the expectation of what you're going to do and when you're going to fix it. And then stick to that. Okay, so you speak to the team and it turns out this client was just badass. It's horrible. It's always horrible. Um, Then maybe they're one of the ones you're never going to fix. Maybe it's time to say goodbye to that client. But you've still listened to them. You've still heard their point of view. You've still made them as feel as good as they can feel in that moment. You've still treated them fairly. And then you've arrived at a decision where you say, Mrs. Jones, I'm really sorry this happened, but like nothing was done outside of our normal processes, procedures. And because of that, if that's the standard of care that you're looking for or your expectation, I don't feel like we're going to manage, to, we're going to be able to meet that as a practice. So I'm, I'm going to recommend that you find another practice that can meet your expectation. And we're happy to transfer records, blah, 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 all of that. And that's a, that's a pretty compassionate, kind way to fire a client. So I th- like, I hope that there's something useful in there. I mean, the, the, the takeaways are be aware of emotionally charged situations. Manage your client expectations so that they understand clearly what's going to happen and make sure that what they think is going to happen is what's going to happen. Or if it looks like that's not going to be the case and the plan changes, speak with them ahead of time and explain why in language they understand. And you're unlikely to have clients that are super upset. If you do get clients that are super upset, then use the process. Um, Listen, empathize, apologize, put it right, um, and you will will not have abusive clients. You'll have happy clients and a lot more happy clients. My main thrust of this is just don't blame clients. Like if we go around blaming clients, then we're definitely screwed. Um, Clients pay our bills, they're the reason we all exist. And yes, it's sad that throughout our careers, we're going to meet people that are morons and make our lives hell. But we're going to meet a lot of people who are not morons and we make their life hell and that's why they get mad. They're the ones we're trying to avoid and, and, and turn back to being good clients and improve our communication skills so, that, so they are happy clients. They're our advocates. They put up with things when they go wrong a little bit because they know trust us they like us we, they know that we've got their back and if something goes wrong we're going to put it right we can completely reduce our grumpy client quotient increase our happiness quotient and have more fun in our jobs if we understand these skills of communication um and my last point is we do something that's highly emotionally charged and we ask a lot of money for it I've seen people losing their shit at people in coffee shops over four pound cup of coffee. Like, so we should not think that we're special in this. We should not think that being a vet or being in the vet profession is terrible just because a headline like that pops up. It's just not true. Own the bit that you can own. Get better at communicating. Uh, Look after your good clients in the way that they deserve to be looked after. Uh, Get rid of the crazy ones as best possible or get your boss to get rid of the crazy ones uh, and life is a lot better okay um so i hope that was useful um it's all about ownership uh so have an awesome thursday um or whatever day it is wherever you are in the world and i will see you on the hamster wheel blog next week take care see ya